This probably isn't news to a lot of you, but apparently Australia is at least 12 hours ahead of the United States at any given moment. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, that's not too weird. I mean, that just means they experience the world ahead of the rest of us by half a day, right? But there's something off here. Take a look at this tweet. Just knew that Australia is one day ahead of America because of the different time zone. But if the Australians lives in the future, then why didn't they warn the Americans about 911? This person pointed something out to all of us two years ago, and we didn't even take notice. Australia theoretically should have known that the 9-11 terrorist attacks were coming, but it appears they didn't do anything to try and warn us. But is that really what happened? Did Australia really just see 9-11 coming and decide to ignore the coming disaster, or did they make an honest effort to warn us that got lost on its way to us? To start off, we're first going to take a look at the types of punishments that the UN might dole out to Australia upon finding that they did nothing to warn the United States about 9-11. If the secret was brought to light just now, over 20 years after the actual event, several things would have to be considered. If it could be proven that Australia did everything in their power to inform America of the coming storm, they would certainly not be punished, but this might be a difficult thing to do. If it came out that Australia did in fact ignore their opportunity to forewarn the United States, there would be a lawsuit on our hands. America would be able to sue Australia for upwards of 40 billion US dollars, or 3 Australian rubles. This is the current commonly accepted fine for failing to warn a country about a coming disaster in about 268 countries, including the world's newest and best hidden country, East Dakota. So let's try to find out whether or not Australia would have to pay this money. It can be assumed that the best technology Australia had in 2001 would allow them to send one messenger to swim across the Pacific Ocean to California with a letter. The letter would, of course, be in a plastic bag so it didn't get wet. It's pretty common knowledge that flippers and oxygen tanks and the like weren't discovered until 2015, when Benjamin Franklin's ghost imparted them onto the White House as a blessing to humanity, which doubled as a reward for legalizing gay marriage. Anyway, the amount of funding required to send this one messenger should have been about 30 US dollars, assuming it takes him only 10 hours to get to his destination with the letter. This would also be assuming he's being paid three times Australia's minimum wage, which is the most the country could be expected to pay him even in such dire circumstances, at least according to Newton's law of thermodynamics. So all Australia would need to do to prove that they did this would be to provide the UN with documentation of this man being paid and the letter being delivered. But obviously, this letter was not delivered, whether it was sent or not. So either nothing was done and Australia is guilty, or they did all they could and the messenger met an unfortunate end in Hawaii, the most dangerous US state by a landslide. But procuring this documentation that would prove Australia innocent might be a challenge. See, to this day, Australia handles documentation and paperwork in a rather archaic way compared to the rest of the world. They keep all their papers and legal documents in a huge stack in the Sydney Opera House, and they just add papers to it when things happen. This can range anywhere from government tax records to parking ticket documentation to vampire sightings. There exists no digital copies of these documents, or even physical copies anywhere except the stack. In fact, this has proven an issue in the past since the 1993 census paperwork was blown off the stack and landed in a nearby tar pit. It has never been recovered to this day. So to find a paper from 2001 that details the hiring of a swimming messenger to warn the United States about 9-11 would be near impossible, even with, like, the world's best Jenga player, Don Cheadle. For now, proving that Australia had done all they possibly could to warn the United States about 9-11 seems pretty difficult, but there might be a few other options available to Scott Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister. So, I hope you're listening, Scott. Can I call you Scott? It's worth noting that the path from the eastern coast of Australia to California is riddled with obstacles and pirates and all sorts of dangers that the Australians of 2001 had no experience with accounting for. So it's actually very likely that their swimmer failed to deliver the letter in a plastic Ziploc bag. There's a simple way to prove that this man not only existed, but was sent by Australia specifically, and not, say, Japan or Tared. See, all Australian babies are branded with a marking that resembles a jar of Vegemite at birth and the UN has made it a war crime for any other nation to fraudulently brand babies with this marking to try and fool their nations into believing their children are Australians for tax reasons. These brandings are a clear 100% certain indicator that a person was born in Australia. But wait a minute, you say, experiencing a thought for the first time. What if the messenger was born in Australia but moved to Japan and then delivered the message from there on behalf of the Japanese government? Well, 
we can ensure that if we find a man at the bottom of the ocean with a letter warning the US about 9-11 and a Vegemite tattoo, he can only be from Australia and nowhere else. This is because Japan had access to Gmail in 2001, three years before its official creation in the United States, due to a time traveler accidentally sending an email to a Japanese person in the year 1845, who happened to be the world's first computer scientist. Anyway, that's a story for another day. This essentially means the Japanese would have no need to send a messenger out to the US to tell them about 9-11 because they instead sent an email to America. But, if you recall, Gmail wasn't created until 2004, so the Americans never received it until then, when it was far too late. Anyway, back to the Australian messenger. The line from Australia to the US across the Pacific Ocean is very straightforward, and since Australia is known for training their swimmers to swim in a perfect straight line even if the waves are really strong, the route the messenger took is 100% certain. It's this line right here. But there's something familiar about this line, right? Something about it reminds you of something, doesn't it? That's right. This line is the edge of this rectangle right here, which is the designated zone for the Martian Ocean Digging Agreement that went on from 2002 to 2009. For those unaware, how long have you been living under a rock? The Martian Ocean Digging Project was an internationally supported agreement that allowed Martians to dig in this specific part of the ocean for human artifacts in case they were bored and needed things to study. That means that if the letter in the plastic bag sank to the bottom of the ocean somewhere on this line, a Martian should have found it. The only way to know would be to contact the Martians and ask them to look through their little Martian filing cabinets to see if they have this 9-11 letter. Unfortunately, we have no way of contacting the Martians, because none of them showed up for the Martian digging project and left a business card. It's still debated to this day whether they exist or not, despite Mr. Bean's alleged heritage. This is good news though, because it means that the letter the Australians wrote should still be on this line right here. All we would need to do is convince the UN to fund a search for the letter, which would only cost about one trillion shillings. That's like two US dollars, I think. Remember though, that it's my own opinion that sending the UN to dig for the letter is the best option. Plenty of other proposed solutions are out there to prove Australia's innocence. I just don't think they're quite as reliable or efficient as this. Now, there are a few different methods that I've heard of to prove that Australia tried their hardest to warn the United States about 9-11 on that fateful day. In fact, the most obvious one that comes at completely no cost would just be to take Scott Morgan and strap him up to a lie detector and ask him what he knows. But lie detectors have recently been found to cause rabies, leading to a national ban on lie detectors starting September 15, 2024. Since the amount of time needed to find Scott Morrigan and also convince him that the lie detector is actually not a lie detector would easily surpass the amount of time the ban remains ineffective for, this option is not viable in today's meta. Some people argue that telling Scott that the lie detector is an espresso machine might help, considering his love for coffee. And this would also get him out of hiding within a couple months' time with any luck. But these people are forgetting that the one common shared weakness of all past and future Australian Prime Ministers is rabies. It used to be a very well-guarded secret, as the Australians want it to be, but the information was leaked by Oprah on the same day the PlayStation 5 came out. This of course means that not very many people know, because they were playing on the PlayStation 5, but it's still the truth. This means that Scott Morrison would undoubtedly be wary of the lie detector even if told it was an espresso machine because, wouldn't you know it, espresso machines have also been shown to cause rabies. Another solution that comes to mind is checking in with New Zealand to see if they know anything. But there's an issue there too. Actually, a few. See, the only way to get to New Zealand is to knock over Australia's stack of paper documents to make a bridge. And if we did that, a large portion of the documents would be destroyed, including birth certificates. This would obviously cause thousands or even millions of Australians to instantly perish, and only for a chance to contact New Zealand to find out if Australia warned the US about 9-11 or not. This option is also hindered by the fact that the entire population of New Zealand is made up of kiwis, often confused with these kiwis, but I assure you, they're the fruits and not the birds. I checked. It was recently discovered that kiwis can speak English, but only when they're under a lot of stress or extremely aroused, which is counterproductive at best and disastrous at worst. Even if we made the sacrifice of potentially millions of Australian lives, we wouldn't be able to communicate with the New Zealanders without first making the atmosphere very tense or uncomfortably sexual. The third and final option I want to discuss here is one that I've seen thrown around a lot, actually, and it seems to do the same thing as the UN Ocean Search while also saving the trillion shillings. It involves performing a seance to contact Freddie Mercury from beyond the grave, since Freddie Mercury is the only human being who ever lived that had the ability to physically locate objects that are located in Ziploc bags. This fact is usually kept a secret, and my mentioning of it will likely make this video censored in about 57 countries. 
Anyway, by asking Freddie Mercury where the 9-11 letter is, we would find out either where it is or that it had never been written depending on his response. But there's the issue. This won't work, because all ghosts who died in November of 1991 can only communicate with the living in Vietnamese. And Freddie Mercury didn't speak Vietnamese, unfortunately. Hey, wait a minute, you may say, experiencing a thought for the second time. Why can't Freddie Mercury just talk to another dead person who didn't die in November 1991 and have them tell us what Freddie Mercury said? Very astute of you. But, alas. Freddie Mercury is bound by supernatural law to not speak to anyone other than Elon Musk, and he's still alive. This is because one night, while drunk, Freddie Mercury accidentally signed a contract written by the Lord of Death himself that restricted him in this way after death in exchange for a totally killer singing voice. Now, you might think that it's possible for Elon Musk to learn Vietnamese and teach it to Freddie Mercury so that Freddie Mercury could respond when asked where the letter at the bottom of the ocean is. But this would require a very large amount of seances. More seances than could be performed before the next full moon, which is when Elon Musk plans to leave Earth for good. So, there you have it. Those are the three most common solutions to this problem that I've seen. Go ahead and comment down below if you've thought of any others, and I'll evaluate their effectiveness and validity to the best of my ability. It might be a while until we find the truth about Australia and their attempts to warn the US about 9-11. I mean, we don't even know for sure if Australia knows what 9-11 is, and we can't until the next United Nations meeting anyway. It's important that discourse in the comments stays respectful. Remember, the nation of Australia is innocent until proven guilty, and like me, you should keep an open mind to the possibility that anything could have happened all those years ago. All we can really do now is thank this anonymous Twitter user for bringing this discrepancy to our attention and allowing us to consider its ramifications over 20 years after 9-11 itself. Thanks for watching, and watch out for rabies. Later.